original home place. That's Radis and Ruth live. Ah. Big house. This is where I was born. <laughs> Say that again. See, this is where I was born on this place right here. And this old shed has got a lot of memories. And my father bought a bull from Urban Camp. It was Miller and Camp. I think it was Bellboy MK. And he bought him as a calf. And uh, of course, there was no pickups in those days. And they decided to send him by freight. They sent him out of Cedar Rapids to Mason City for around, I think, $20. And <laughs> this. And he came through in great shape. I don't know how long he was en route, but be that as it may, uh, it was quite an unusual uh, way to send a bull, but uh, it worked out. <laughs> oh gosh, let's see, I wonder if we can kind of... <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> so explain what we're seeing here. So this is the crate. As you can see, he was just a calf, but uh, fortunately, uh, he came through in great shape, and evidently they handled him with tender, loving care uh, for him to arrive uh, safely. What year was this been? <sighs> wish I, I wish I had that book. Uh, 1930s? Or? Yes, probably in the 30s. Mm -hmm. okay. And so tell me about the farm here. Um, let's come on, come on back outside. Tell me about the fact that you're born here. And... Well, my father, let's see, get over here, will you? My father was the 13th of 14 children. And uh, each, uh, when you got uh, 21 years of age, each child, male and female, got 80 acres. Uh, he paid for 40 of it, and he expected the offspring to pay for the other 40. And, um, and so my, it's amazing that the fact that he had 14 children to give 80 acres, that my father ended up with his 80 acres right next to the home farm, which is just uh, north of here, about uh, a quarter of a mile. And uh, then, of course, my father bought more land, and as did most of the offsprings uh, through the years. But uh, it, uh, it's um, got a creek through it. It's ideal for cattle in some parts. Of, and that's why I've, one of the reasons I think my dad wanted to, father wanted to continue in the Angus business uh, was the fact that he did have this land that uh, wasn't uh, because of the creek running through it. There was water and uh, was not tillable, and it was a wise decision that he made. So, uh, uh, thinking about, uh, as, as we visit now, how we used to have the machinery all in here, and played in here a lot as a boy, with the among the machinery, pretending that I was uh, an operator of it, whatever it was. Let's go outside. This, you were born here, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and was born right in that house there. Yep. Sure. Well, it was. Um, Just keep walking. Um, our school was uh, on our property, about uh, a short half a mile to the east, and uh, but I had a lot of cousins went to school too, so we would walk to school together. And uh, I, by the same token, uh, we were kept busy. You might say from when seven years of age, you started milking cows, and we had our chores to do. But I'll have to say this, my father was not a slave driver, but I think he felt it was important that we learn at an early age that uh, we needed to start working and uh, being a part of the operation. And so we just, as a result, I think it made, made it much easier for my brother and I, as we grew older, uh, working as a team with, my, with our father in partnership. 
uh, that we had that experience of working from almost as long as I can remember, working together. And uh, we, I'll have to say this, that all through the years, we hardly ever had a, a, an angry word spoken, which is sort of unusual, but we, we really had a wonderful relationship. So you think uh, you would have ever wanted to do anything different but farm and raise cattle? No, I've, I've, I've never ever regretted the day that uh, rather than maybe as I was in the military and had an opportunity to re-up again and probably get a, a very good assignment, but uh, I've never regretted not one day that coming back and being a, a part of the family operation. And uh, I say again, probably a lot of it stemmed from the fact that I had a tremendous, uh, wonderful uh, experience farming with my in partnership with my brother, my father and my brother. And then it always helped that my dad always had good cattle to show. So uh, we had the experience of standing usually closer to the top than the bottom. And uh, it's a combination of things. Uh, and, and, and I just loved also working the soil. I had something about tilling it and when you'd plow to see the new uh, earth turnover. Uh, so there, I just enjoyed almost every aspect of uh, farming. Now my grandfather uh, was a German immigrant. He and his family uh, came over from Germany in about 1854. Well, since they didn't have the money to uh, come on a passenger, a regular passenger boat, they came over in a sailboat. My uh, grandfather was nine months old. He was the youngest of the children on the boat. And unfortunately, fortunately for him, but unfortunately he was the only baby that lived. Uh, the rest because of lack of refrigeration and fresh fruits and vegetables and like. They were all buried at sea. And um, so he was a hardy old soul from the day he was born. And uh, so then, um, of course, my father was, grandfather was a, really a, evidently quite an animal husbandman. His uh, livestock were, they said his horses were the very best, and he took uh, really great care for them. You had to brush them down before they were harnessed in the morning, and at night, of course, was a, they were uh, brushed down again, and the harnesses were with a gunny sack, all wiped clean and dry so there would be no soil or dirt uh, on the collars to, because if they did, uh, they would get sore shoulders. So then he, they had, of course, uh, every species almost. Uh, they had uh, cattle, hogs, uh, no sheep, and uh, beef cattle. And shorthorns were the predominant breed at that time. And uh, of course, all the cattle uh, were shipped, uh, for, for slaughter, were shipped up to Chicago by rail, and uh, he um, had a, he and his brother-in-law uh, each had a carload of cattle, and they took them to Chicago, and while they were there, they saw uh, posters stating that there was going to be a sale of imported Angus bull calves on, at the Columbian Exposition, and this was in 1893. So, uh, but my grandfather, as soon as he saw the picture on this poster, he, he, he knew he just had to go see what these animals looked like. So as soon as his cattle were sold on the market, he took a trolley across town to the shores of Lake Michigan. And why they had the sale in conjunction with the Columbian Exposition, I'm really not sure. So he picked out three of the top bulls, hoping that he'd get one of them. Well, the opening bid was more than his carload of cattle brought him. Very disappointed, he returned home, but there was always in the back of his mind, he just someday hoped he could have a, get one of those Angus bulls that made on his shorthorns. I think it was about three years later in 1896, uh, there was a poster in the local elevator, and uh, so he, this gentleman would, would trade a Angus bull for a uh, perch on stallion. 
Well, my grandfather had Perchons, and immediately he contacted him, and after exchange of letters, uh, it was on a given day, they were going to exchange. Uh, the Angus Bull was going to be put on a boxcar in South Dakota, and a Perchon Stallion would be put on a boxcar in Garner, Iowa, and you got up there two hours ahead of time in anticipation of this new Angus Bull they were going to get. Before the car could hardly come to a screeching halt, they flung open the door, and here in the corner was this 400-pound, woolly, black Angus calf. And the neighbors all snickered. He said, well, Fritz Grayman really got snookered. But uh, as the young man matured, he turned out to be a, a, a decent uh, sort of a bull calf. And he made them on those shorthorns. So the first crop of calves that he took to Chicago, the extreme top was $5 a hundred. And he got $7 a hundred. And he said that uh, the order buyers had never seen anything like it. The pens were just teeming with order buyers. And they said to my grandfather, young man, you bring those kind of cattle to, to the Chicago market and you'll never have to worry whether the market is up or down well, when he got home, he called his six sons out together in the middle of the yard and he punched each one of them in the chest and he said, boys, as long as I'm alive, there'll be nothing. And I said, I mean nothing but Angus bulls graze these pastures. And to this day, my grandsons, Kyle and Cole, are the fifth generation. They still hear great-great-grandfather's voice ringing down. There'll be nothing but Angus bulls graze these pastures. <laughs>